Welcome to GraphQL Toronto. So the first speaker will be Charles Nelson from OK Grow, and I'll let him introduce Good evening, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about an opinionated approach to server-side rendering with React 16, Apollo 2, styled components, which is CSS and JavaScript, and React Router 4. Uh, I, I'd like to apologize about my emojis. It looks like uh, Google is trying to be smart here and uh, make it cross-platform, but my Mac doesn't like this at all. Uh, my name is Charles. I'm a software developer at OKGrow. OK we build web and mobile apps for clients, as well as doing consulting and training in JavaScript, React, React Native, and GraphQL. Uh, I get excited about pretty much anything web-related. Uh, so if you guys want to chat about anything after, please come and approach me. Okay, uh, in this talk I'm making some assumptions here, and I'd like to see a show of hands. Like, do we all know JavaScript to some extent? Thanks, that's good. Uh, React? Okay, uh, and, uh, and that's good. Uh, GraphQL as well. Uh, how about uh, CSS and JavaScript? Have you guys played around with that? Okay, we could. Um, and style components, emotion. Glamour, so yeah, okay, it's all about the same, so at least uh, I know who I'm talking to now. Uh, and React Router version 4 is, or React, Rout, React Router version 3 as well, like a, a few people, okay. And anyone has, has anyone done server side rendering before? Okay. <clears throat> We can, okay, I'm talking to a good audience, so uh, if you have any questions or anything, please come chat to me after, or like ask them. Uh, hopefully, what I'm talking about will make sense to, to everyone. So, what's server-side rendering? Uh, it's where the content requested by a client, normally a web browser, is generated and rendered out onto the server before we send it to the client. Uh, this is what we commonly used to do before we all jumped onto the bandwagon of single page web apps, uh, which enabled generating the web page on the client from a single JavaScript bundle. And this was meant for performance improvements, which it did at the time, but as I'm sure everyone is aware, our bundles kept on growing and growing and growing in size until, I guess, we kind of made the internet bloated and slow. Uh, so these days, now, we've kind of gone back towards server-side rendering again, which is what we used to always do, rendering static HTML with some scripts, CSS, and everything else. Links are all in there on the server, and then we're sending them down to the client. Uh, so I guess the distinction these days with single page apps is that we are rendering on the client, uh, on the server, sorry, but we only do this for the first initial page visit or view. Uh, then we let our single page app, which is in its, job, it's in, in its JavaScript bundle, uh, to take over and do the rest of the routing and changing. <clears throat> so why server-side rendering? Well, I guess some of the main reasons you've probably heard before is SEO, performance, and progressive enhancement. Uh, to dive a little bit deeper into SEO, um, server-side rendering allows web crawlers to pass your website. Uh, without server-side rendering, most uh, web crawlers these days, they, they don't pass or execute JavaScript. They're not intelligent like that, so they're not going to wait for your client bundle to be passed and executed, load the React to your GraphQL queries to your server, load the data, for example, just to render your components. So for all intents and purposes, the web crawler is going to see nothing on your page unless you've manually hard-coded some HTML uh, in there. <coughs> uh, Google is also implementing by July of this year like in uh, mobile your mobile speed, speed will affect your search results, so it's probably a good time, at least if you're an SEO-heavy website, to probably think about um, performance as well as SEO and what server-side rendering can do for this, especially on your mobile views. 
Okay, so some of the big performance improvements um, you guys probably are aware of, or if you're not, you should have a look at some of the Google uh, Google's developers uh, material out there on First Meaningful Paint and Time to Interactive. Uh, these ones are where you'll see significant improvements uh, for my, in most cases. Uh, without tinkering though, you'll probably see slowdown in your time to first byte. Uh, just because it takes longer on your server, it's having to handle requests and it's having to grab all your data, render that React, and then send it back down to the client. Uh, another, another benefit as well, which might not be talked about as much, is progressive enhancements. Uh, what I mean by this is that I'm sure if you go on to a lot of React sites these days and you see, if you go disable JavaScript or anything else, if you're not server-side rendering, you're going to get a pretty sad looking website. Uh, so with server-side rendering, at least you can compile, or uh, compile something, generate it, render it on the server and send it down to the client and your client, no matter uh, what browser or that they're using, uh, they'll be able to see something at least, uh, which they can interact with. It won't be the greatest experience, but at least it's it's a baseline that you can progressively enhance from. Uh, just another word of warning here is that server-side rendering isn't always faster out of the box and may require some fine-tuning. It's not a silver bullet. Don't get overexcited and start server-side rendering every single page that you can get your hands on. Um, you should really consider your business requirements and what you want to be doing or achieving. Uh, but Apollo, React Apollo, gives you some nice little uh, ways to, to break out of this if you want to disable uh, specific server-side rendering for certain components or for whole type pages, whatever uh, it's possible on a per query or per component basis, uh, which is it's quite as it's as simple as putting in the options and if you're used to Apollo. Uh, just setting SSR to false. Okay, uh, let's have a look at what, what a client would see if you're just doing client-side rendering, which is what a lot of websites these days are doing. Uh, as you can see up there, there's actually not much in there. There's normally people hard code your title, a link to your favicon. There will also maybe be some metadata or, any, uh, or something. But normally this would be dynamic if you want to change the title metadata and other things like that uh, on each page change. Um, all React apps normally have this div ID render target, which you'll see in the body, as well as normally you'll have a script tag, which is your client-side framework bundle, and then your actual app bundle. Normally that's what's common for single page apps. Uh, but if I was a web crawler, or potentially someone with my JavaScript disabled, I'm not going to end up seeing much at all. So let's take a look at server-side rendering. Now, when we server-side render, this is a, I have like cut out all the, the content in there that where you see um, inside the render target, you'll see there's a div ID app, and that is basically uh, where my React components will have been rendered into and it is displayed all in there for me. You'll also notice that there's a script with window.apollo state, and that is um, some of Apollo Client's cache, and uh, some of the magic in regards to being able to initialize your cache, kind of similar to how uh, React's hydration works, in the fact that we're sending down uh, initial state for our Apollo Client down in the initial page render, so that we don't have to do extra network requests. And this is a really awesome feature, um, as it helps performance and uh, it's a single request instead of multiple round robin trips. Uh, another one in here, which you might be wondering now, there's a style tag in the head, uh, and that is styled components. It'll be a safe promotion on blah, blah. And it's in there, and it's basically inlining your styles uh, so SEO and Google will be happy in regards to web page performance uh, because you're only adding here the global styles plus your inline styles for your components uh, that is being visible on the page. Uh, so that obviously decreases your size, uh, which helps in performance in regards to sending to a client when there's slow networks. And it also helps with slow mobile devices, for example, where their CPU is limited bandwidth.
So why React Apollo? Uh, it works really well hand in hand with React and uh, site rendering model. Um, and if you're already using React Apollo or just Apollo client and the Apollo server and React by itself, um, it's, it only takes a few lines to convert into enabling server side rendering. And as I said, you don't need to enable this for all, uh, for all routes or pages. You could just do it on your landing page or a few, uh, a few um, specific pages that you'd like. Uh, another thing is that it's also not too far off the way that React Apollo works and what it expects is promises. The, uh, it's using an Apollo provider, uh, which we'll talk about later and we'll get to see. Um, and also uh, get the client uh, data from, uh, from the React component tree. Uh, but if you're using Redux, for example, with Redux Thunk, and you're using uh, that to query your data, if you're wanting to switch over, from, and you have a React app with Redux Thunk and everything, um, maybe using GraphQL or not, it's, um, it's pretty simple to uh, add that in. And as React Apollo um, is, uh, is expecting promises to be returned, you just have to pass that back uh, to it, and as it matches the function, the expected function signature, it just works. And when you see this, uh, it's kind of like, wow, um, I didn't think it'd be that easy just to hook up Redux Thunk into uh, my GraphQL, my Polar client, and everything, and it just works. Server side rendering, no problem. So, I guess what another reason why, like, of React Apollo is also really interesting, which I kind of touched on before, was uh, you can cache, uh, it caches the head and store with re and rehydrates it on the client from the server, which is again similar to React's own uh, server side rendering model, uh, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, some other cool little features which I won't be touching on because I could talk for, for a very long time about this is that. Um, if you buy into the Apollo ecosystem, there's also Apollo Engine, which you can run without. But if you're on a Node app and you're using Apollo Client or React Apollo, and this does work as well for like the view, if you want, if you're using Vue, for example, or um, Angular, uh, is the Apollo Engine has caching as well as uh, tracing. But the caching is interesting because it will cache your Apollo requests or your GraphQL requests. Uh, which can help speed up your site site rendering. Uh, you can also cache the rendered responses, um, so the actual HTML that you send back to them. You can you can just cache. You can put varnish, for example, in front of it, and it just works. And your server won't be getting hit. Your GraphQL layer won't be getting hit. And again, like though, these all have their pros and cons, and they do require a bit more tinkering. Uh, and again, this would only be done for maybe public pages that you. Uh, wanting everyone to get, and it's not being customized with dynamic content for specific users. Um, you also have the ability, which I mentioned before, to skip queries for SSR, uh, and I'd recommend just having a look at the docs because it is pretty. It's pretty simple. It's just in the options, and SSR is true or false. Uh, it defaults to true, um, uh, so you just want to turn that off if you're like if you're doing a query. Um, and you can also avoid network requests, uh, so I'm not sure how many people are using Apollo 1 or Apollo 2, but it's very much worth the upgrade from Apollo 1 to Apollo 2. It's not too painful. Um, I think everyone should upgrade if you guys are on Apollo 1 still. Um, they have a great migration documentation path, and you should go have a look on their GitHub. Um, they have before and afters codes, and it's very straightforward, and you're using the Apollo link which now allows you to do web sockets, HTTP, you can do local queries. And the reason I mention this is if your server-side rendering and your GraphQL, so uh, if your Express server and your GraphQL server is on the same, like in the same node instance of the same server, uh, you might want to skip the network requests, which you'd be doing through a HTTP link, um, just to speed up your performance. So let's dive a little bit into how React Apollo works and but before I do, I want to briefly just describe at a high level React server side rendering model, just so you can maybe see how close, how closely together like this works hand in hand. 
Um, so what React does when it does server-side rendering is it creates the virtual DOM representation of your React components, um, which you can see in this tree up here, for example. Um, and these, this can exist anywhere, server, browser. I get React Native again, so there's also... Um, and that's what's really powerful about React is that they have this virtual uh, representation of all your components and nodes in the tree. And you're able to then uh, transpile and uh, render this out to different environments. Um, so once the virtual DOM representation is created, we render this out as a string, which is just your HTML, which we saw previously with the server-side rendering. That's, that's what gets sent down to the client. Um, we send this stringified HTML to, to your client, and then we and the client will render this out very fast. It's server-side uh, rendering is what we used to always do. Um, and React on the client will then start to, once the JavaScript is enabled, recreate the virtual DOM, and this is known as hydration um, or rehydration, uh, from the HTML sent down from the server. And if it matches up, if the React virtual DOM wrap matches up with the representation that it's actually looking in the real DOM, it will not cause a re-render. Um, and this has a significant performance boost and makes it really awesome uh, because you're timed to interactive, which is the speed of when you get your first page, like first meaningful page, so you see something on the screen. So for example, this is a web page, you see this, but I try to go click on some buttons there, and it's not interactive. Uh, that, that lag or that input um, latency between there, that's, that's the time between the first meaning book pane and the time to interactive. So uh, you want to reduce that uh, significantly and you want to make sure that there's no noticeable lag or any blocking going on that's noticeable to the client. And this is more significant on slow networks and mobile phones that have uh, limited CPU bandwidth. Okay, so jumping back to how React Apollo works. Um, it, it, it follows very closely to React's own server-side uh, rendering approach, and uh, it occurs in two distinct phases. Uh, an async phase, where you traverse the tree to fetch the data of our components, and the synchronous phase, which is when we render out the React component after having retrieved all the required data that we're passing to our component. And if you, can look, if you look up here, there's the component tree, and uh, We've got it wrapped in a data container. This data container is, if you imagine, it's a, a query that you have that you've wrapped around your React component, uh, and you're requesting some data. Maybe it's uh, some stock data from a stock exchange, for example, or it could just be your current, like if your your uh, your own profile, if you're logged in, for example. Uh, the other components there that are synchronous. It's, I'm just saying here that it's synchronous in the sense that. We already have all the data that uh, our components require, so we're able to render that out completely. And what uh, React Apollo does is it walks down the React component tree. It will first look for that async one. It it's then awaits that. It's a promise. It basically then goes, searches, see if there's a node or a leaf, like a synchronous one, and it goes back up, and it renders out all the nodes that it can while it's waiting for the promise to resolve for the data. Once that promise resolves, it will then uh, React Apollo then dives down again recursively, looking for the next asynchronous function to basically uh, query for, uh, so which would be B in this case. Uh, then while that's waiting to resolve, it goes back up the tree to A, and it then dives down to the left uh, on the synchronous nodes or components, and it renders them all out. Um, once B is ready with the data, it comes back and then it loads down. And this is just the, how React Apollo uh, works, and this is similar to what React does in regards to how they do their batching and updating state and uh, props and context. <clears throat> so I guess uh, another thing which I don't want to forget before is that as we've walked this tree and we've gathered all the data for our components that we're going to send through through our GraphQL, which in this case is Apollo with our Apollo client, um, we've now got all this data in our cache on the server side. So this is all happening on the server side. Um, and we now have all this cache, which is awesome. But if we send this down without the cache to the client, for example, when React, we'll, get, we'll, we'll have a nice first render, but when React and uh, GraphQL or public client loads up and um, gets passed, uh, 
it's going to fire off some queries back to the server to ask for that data for the React components because it's missing. We don't have that in our store. So what we do and what we make sure is that the point is that we extract the caged data that's been normalized for us by Apollo client, um, and we basically stringify that and we send it down to the client. So marshalling, demarshalling, or um, if you guys are familiar with that, or in React's terminology, it's hydration uh, and rehydrate. Um, so we're just serializing the data, which is just a JSON object. We stringify it, send it down, we attach it to which you saw before, window dot underscore Apollo state. Um, and then Apollo client will basically load that up. Uh, the cache will uh, use that uh, to initialize the state so it doesn't need to do extra round robin trips of like saying, hey, please give me uh, my user, my profile data, please give me uh, the stock data for like Apple and Google. Okay, so let's jump back towards to a higher level of things to consider when thinking about server-side rendering. Uh, some important things here is that you probably main two things I would always think about is the content and authentication. Um, authentication here, I'm not talking about authorization, but um, which is also equally as important, but just, we're just discussing authentication here. Authorization can be done at your own implementation level in regards to if the person should be allowed to see a state or access it, do they have the permission? Uh, we're, not, we're not worrying about like how we're going to authenticate the person. So in content, we really need to think about, I guess I could break this down into four, four areas. Static content, dynamic content, um, public and private content. So what I mean by here is static content is when it's all hard-coded up beforehand, before your runtime, before your server executes. Uh, if you're just serving static content and you want to use React and GraphQL, then have a think about Gatsby. It's an awesome, fast thing. Apollo Docs even uses it for their own website. They're using Gatsby. Um, so it's really great for static content. And static content is normally stuff that you don't expect to change. And what I mean by dynamic content, I've been using the example of uh, stock price. It might change every five minutes or uh, ten minutes, and you're querying for that to get updated. It's going to change, so you, you might be rendering a different component based on that data changing. Um, so uh, again, we'll server side render that, but it is dynamic content in the sense that it's not all in our file system or it's not in memory somewhere, uh, and we're having to query off to a database to an external API service. Etc. So when we're talking about public and private, this kind of overlaps with uh, static and dynamic. Uh, public means you don't need to be logged in, you're just serving to anyone, anyone that requests that data, you're happy to pass it back to them. Uh, and that's the simplest, that, that is sim with Apollo uh, client and React Apollo, it's a couple of lines if you're already using React Apollo to enable server-side rendering and you're away you go. Um, it's it's really quite amazing. Uh, <clears throat> with private private content, we have to then think about authentication and what do we actually want to server side render? Do you actually want to render uh, something if a person has already visited and they have a cookie or their authentication token saved and when they hit your, for example, Facebook, that they're logged in automatically and they're going to see their customized view. Um, so I guess you could do server side rendering there, but again, then you. Once you start to scale, you can run into lots of issues and you'll have to do fine tinkering and tuning in regards to what you'd be caching, for example, so that you're not having multiple requests hitting your servers and trying to render uh, slightly different content. Uh, so I'll touch briefly on authentication here and I'll say that I would recommend using JSON web tokens um, for authentication, it's a pretty good standard that a lot of people have support and um, uh, are behind, and it's the recommended way in regards to using and working with a public client. Um, what sometimes gets confused here is that uh, it isn't as clear sometimes is that we can use cookies to store this JSON web token, or we could uh, use the HTML5 web storage, which is local storage or session storage. Uh, they both have their pros and cons and security 
ramifications. I'm not a security expert, so I'm going to like stay off those. Um, but there are some links I've added down below, which I would recommend going to click on later if you guys are more interested in understanding that in more detail. Um, but it's either way is okay. Um, as long as you make sure you take the necessary precautions to stop across uh, some common issues that, will, that are apparent if you just have a quick Google search for those. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to also just show you uh, what you have to do or how simple it is to add cookies um, or to use or to add authentication either by cookies or local storage. Uh, the first example here is through cookies. Um, the benefit here is that the browser does most of the work for us, um, and all we're actually changing in here is we're adding credentials of the same origin in the create HTTP link. Um, if your backend has a different domain to your front end, then you're going to have to change that, swap it out, and use include, and that's when you then jump into the issues of the course and everything else. Um, so, for example, if you're using Express and you're using the common cause library, uh, then that would be one way to basically enable cause and then you won't get some conflicts and the content won't be served to you. So this is an example of local storage here and in this way we're leveraging the browser again uh, by using the HTTP um, headers there with an authorization. However, we're having to use JavaScript in the sense, uh, or more JavaScript here, uh, and if we, we have to always grab it from local storage, uh, which Anyone can, like, as long as, long as it's from the same domain, they can, um, any other JavaScript that's executing can take a look at this. Uh, so that's one, of the, the, that's one of the security concerns in regards to this uh, approach, but it is still a very valid approach and uh, one of the recommended ones. Um, but as you can see here, we have an auth token down in the client config as well. We can see I'm doing a check here for which is a boolean is client. If it is, then we're going to wrap our link, which is our normal link, which would be on the server, in an auth link, uh, which all it is doing is it's basically grabbing a token that we've stored in, in our local storage, and we're sending that back in uh, authorized, as an authorization header um, in our query, which then our server will grab or call the client, or server will grab for us from the context. <clears throat> Uh, again, in here, there's the cache. We can, again, here, this is how we initialize the cache or rehydrate, um, if you want to use the terminology or hydrate um, or react. Uh, we go cache.restore window.polo state. If we're on the server side, we're going to have an empty cache or a new cache, um, which we want to ensure that we always, on every single request from the server side rendering, we always make a new cache. Uh, and I'll touch on this later on. Uh, and the other parameter there that you can see is server side um, SSR mode, and when that's on, you, it's true when you're on the server, and false when it's on the client. Okay, now let's uh, have a walk through um, with React, React Apollo. Let's dump, jump into some of that stuff. Um, uh, but before. Before I do, I want to briefly touch on some style components of React Router 4, and uh, for the, any of those who are less familiar, and just to show, I guess, how these play in regards to providing a, a, full, a full solution for server-side rendering. Okay. Uh, with, with style components, there's three main functions that we really care about. Inject global, uh, server style sheet, and style sheet manager. Uh, the basic idea is that every time you render your app on server, you create a server style sheet and you add a provider to the React tree. And this is a similar approach in regards to Apollo client, uh, or React Apollo, I should say, sorry, and how it does server side rendering. And you'll see this later in some examples of code. Um, so on every single request, we create a new server style sheet, which is a provider, and it accepts styles via React's context API. That's how it's passing them all around. Um, and again, what it's doing is it's extracting the styles from your components, and then it's generating a minified inlined styles, like CSS, which it's injecting um, into the head, which you saw briefly in my example of server-side rendering before. And basically, it's, it's pretty awesome. It gives you an emotion and glamorous. It's, it's very similar. Uh, it's giving you inline styles, which is a tick from Google for SEO, and it's a performance boost because you're not sending down uh, huge globs of CSS. 
uh, that isn't needing to be there for that page. Uh, the word of warning though is if you've got lots of globals everywhere and you're using inject global and you're just and then if you have lots of globals, you're obviously losing that performance benefit. So React Router 4, um, we, we really care about four main things that you probably interact with most commonly, is that on the client, we have the browser router, and this is just a HTML5 history API. It uses push, replace, pop, state. So it's similar to any other like property like HTML5 router that you use. Um, and with React Router 4 versus version 3, um, everything you see in React Router version 4 is a component. It's a React component, and that's what makes it really awesome with server-side rendering as well, and pretty straightforward, is it's a React component. React does its thing, and React Apollo is able to do its thing, and as long as you pass some props to it, and its state, its context, it's happy, and it will, doesn't matter where you're throwing it around. The only distinction is that on the server, you use a static router, because we don't have the HTML5 uh, history API, and we also aren't really, we're not in this case wanting to do any server-side routing as such, like we're not going to be changing, it's going to be a static, it's static or fixed location. <clears throat> uh, switch and, re um, yeah, so, sorry, uh, the, the route and the switch uh, components is, uh, the route component just renders your UI when it matches a location um, on the, on the in the URL, uh, and then the switch is basically just is a unique way to render a route exclusively. In contrast, if you just put routes without a switch there, if you have, for example, forward slash like for your home or something, it will match against any route that has a forward slash in it. So you might have like slash home slash uh, foo and slash bar. You'll actually render out all three components, which isn't normally what you want to do. Um, so that's why we use a switch, and then in that case, it's whichever component it matches first, unless you pass an additional prop which tells it to be an exact match, uh, which you'll see again a little bit later on. Okay, now let's put this all together with React Apollo, um, as that's what we're all here to talk about GraphQL. Um, so then now let's see what happens when we, for server-side rendering. So I guess the magic source for this is render to string with data. Um, and in this example, which is hopefully is a little bit small, uh, but I'll be diving into more of the specifics uh, later on, which will be more blown up for everyone. Uh, but you can see up here is that at the very top we have a function signature that matches an express so, um, an express middleware or any other like request response uh, server a query. Uh, we set the context on the top, uh, and at the very top we have some styles, which as I said, you'll probably notice in a little bit after I dive through this, that it follows the same kind of pattern that React Apollo does here. Um, as I mentioned before, we're creating a new cache, a new client, every single time we have a request. Uh, and this is really important to do, because if you don't do this, you'll basically be getting old stale data from a previous request, or from somebody else, um, and uh, you don't want to be sending like content down from another user if, for example, you're doing uh, authenticated uh, private server-side rendering, uh, or, for example, maybe you don't want to be sending some invalid data from another URL uh, down on this request because it will do some funky things on the client. Um, in the next step, you'll see here this is the component, and that's probably that's. That there is your React, uh, your React component. That's your whole entire React tree, or what will be, and it's wrapped at the very top in your Apollo provider, uh, which you pass your client to. We then have our static router, which this is because we're on the server side, which is your React router, uh, which is setting the location, which is where the route is, and that's how you, like later on, you'll see is how you get to your routes and you render your UI based on uh, the route that you've passed. And you're also setting the context there, um, which you can uh, sometimes do, for example, if you want to do redirects. Uh, then we have our style sheet manager, which again is just another, similar to Apollo provider in the sense that it's, uh, your sheet is like a client, or it's your cache, it's all your inline styles um, or for there, which you're going to use to render out uh, when React walks through its component tree. 
Uh, and now on to a way to render to string with data the component. That's where all the uh, React magic happens, or React Apollo magic happens, which I discussed previously when I was talking about how walking the component tree. Uh, the next step there is like we initialize the cache, or and, and when, what I mean by this, we are extracting the data from the cache, which has already been initialized or has been set up from React Apollo walking the tree and resolving all our queries. Uh, and the next step again, which is with style, uh, style tags, sheet .get style element. Uh, as you're seeing here, this is the same sense that because uh, React Apollo or, and React had uh, gone across and they've uh, gone across the tree and rendered all our components out, uh, we're able, style components is able to grab the styles that are relevant only for those specific components and then uh, pass them off to our HTML, which we're going to render out later. Uh, and there's a little extra tip there, which I didn't mention and that really will be using, but I think it might be worthwhile for anyone to be aware of is React Helmet. Um, there's other packages out there that are similar, but this one's by the NFL. Uh, it's pretty decent, it has its pros and cons. Um, but this is how you can dynamically change your body or HTML attributes. You can set meta, title, uh, data in your head, scripts, uh, links, and change anything dynamically based on your components. Uh, and then finally, we have our HTML, and that HTML we'll see a little bit later on. And that is just a helper component which is taking some props like our helmet, our styles, and our actual content, which is what we're rendering, which is what our React Apollo has uh, resolved. Uh, and then the initial cache of the client state. Uh, which is our Apollo uh, cache. And then in our response, we're just sending down, which you can see is a stringified uh, HTML. It's just a string. We're sending that down and we're stamping it into our document when it uh, arrives on the client. Uh, I haven't added in here, but we, as we are inside to try and catch, if there's ever an error that's occurring when we're trying to walk uh, the render to string with, data component, uh, with the component there, as it's asynchronous, it may throw, and we want to catch this. If there was an error of whatever kind, you probably want to render out some meaningful and nice error display message. And in that the case, it's very similar to the above logic, um, in the sense that you basically have some styles, uh, and you don't need a static like a route necessarily in this case. You can just render out some some, H, uh, some HTML. Okay, as I mentioned before, there was the HTML. Let's actually, now you guys can actually see what we're rendering out on the server and that we're sending to the client. Um, as I mentioned before, React Helmet here, and you can see is it's dynamically setting HTML and body attributes as well as like some, the head tags, like the meta, scripts, styles, links, it's anything in there. Um, and what we're doing, you, you have uh, two component or two string, and in this case, because we're actually doing React components, like here, we're doing the components. Um, uh, the next step here is you can see render target dangerously set in a HTML content. That there is actually our, as a, as our content that we're rendering out, that our component that we saw previously um, over here, our component, uh, that's actually what's been resolved and that we're rendering based on that location of that URL and the queries that were uh, attached to it. Uh, so that's, what's, that's where everything is going to be uh, injected into uh, and rendered out. Uh, finally, we also have this script, which is our cache, our initial polo state. And this is really important and really awesome here, is that we're kind of hydrating it, we're, um, and we're serializing our state, and we're sending it down to our client so that the polo client will not do an extra query and when React uh, boots up and asks for, where's my data for my components that I need to render? Um, it will be able to grab it from the Apollo cache uh, and it will just render immediately. And if all goes well, React will not do a re-render, which improves our performance, our time to interactive. And this is one of the really powerful things because a lot of times, if even with server-side rendering, when we're not using GraphQL, or even if you are using GraphQL, but you're not using Apollo Client and React Apollo, is that you're actually doing two network requests and you're also doing an unnecessary render. Uh, 
But the main point here is not doing that additional network request to ask for, hey, I want my data. Like, you've already rendered it once, that extra. If you're on a slow network query, it's going to uh, slow everything down and it's not going to be a great experience for your users. Okay, now let's see what's uh, on the client side. What, are, what, what, what do we actually do here and what's, uh, how do we route everything and what's going on? I've been talking about hydration, like how, how long is that? Okay, so this is what we're going to render and this is generic in a sense. So I'm not sure how you guys are bundling. It might be Webpack, it might be another framework, or bundler. Whatever it is, normally you'll have something like this. Um, where the Apollo client is what you've seen previously with the config, um, so we're importing that. Um, and our app, you, see, you will see the next stage, which is just all our components with our like headers, our footer, uh, maybe a nav, like our routes, and all our components. But on the browser, it looks very similar to web app. It's just got an Apollo provider, a browser router instead of a static router, and we don't have our styles here. The reason we don't have our styles here is because it's already been inlined into the head of our uh, as CSS in the head of our HTML, so it's all available for us automatically. Um, and now the little bit of React magic here is that uh, we're exporting here the hydrate function, and uh, this is where you would, in Webpack, you'd like attach this to your module hot loading, like if you're doing that in your um, dev environment, for example, or other frameworks will just handle this for you. Um, like on startup, you just invoke this function, and it would basically Look in your document on the client side, that you only execute this on the client side, to be clear, sorry. It finds the element, render target, and basically it adds or um, injects the web app for there. And that, this is how React works. Okay, uh, and here we are. This is the app which is shared on the both client and server. Um, and it's pretty simple. Like, I'm just keeping it very simple here. We have a head, which is like uh, normally our metadata and other things like that. We've got a nav, the routes, which we'll touch on later. That's where all our UI components are that actually change based on what route you're requesting. And then we've got a footer, uh, which is going to be no matter what, it's just generic and shared across all routes, for example. Uh, the only other interesting thing in here is inject global. Uh, you can inject global CSS styles here, and this is where you do the font face, for example, uh, if you wanted your fonts and stuff, which is one of the gotchas you need to be aware of, because you'll get a weird uh, flashing of fonts, and etc. if you try to do server-side rendering and you don't have your fonts available, for example. Um, so uh, that inject global is really an escape mechanism, mechanism by style components. You should only call this once somewhere, if possible, because uh, you can run into problems uh, when you're calling this multiple times and it's rendering these globals and mashing them all up into your single page. And you also want to be trying to minimize uh, your globals in the sense of the word. Okay, now let's look at our routes. So for anyone that's used to uh, React Router 4, this should be pretty common. I'm just touching this very, very briefly. As I mentioned before, the switch and the routes. So the switch, it basically matches the first one, the example with the forward slash, the exact path, I want to render home. Uh, with switch here and exact, we're putting the exact there, so for example, process and contact won't be, won't match. And finally, the last one, if no matches are found in the switch, uh, we use a not found component which we'd render out. Okay, let's see the server side and as I I promised, uh, here we are, that, like you can see in a little bit more detail, the Apollo provider static router and style sheet manager, uh, which I think I've already kind of gone into in quite a little bit of detail, uh, but I just wanted you to see here, if for anyone up at the back um, that might not have been able to see. Um, again, React Apollo and the magic is really happening in the render to string with data, uh, and that's really how simple it is, and that's, you're going to see this no matter where you go, you'll see something similar to this. Okay, uh, just thought I'd mention that like after uh, what's happening here with uh, the styles again, is this, this pattern here where we're instantiating the new server style sheet is, a, is very much the same as what we're doing here for the Apollo provider uh, and render to string with data. So it's the same model, so it should make sense to you guys, or if you can wrap your heads around 
uh, either one or the other. That's why like inlining your styles in CSS and JavaScript really, I think, works well with GraphQL or Apollo, React Apollo, Apollo Client, and um, React. Uh, if you're doing style components, just a word of caution, don't forget to use the Babel plugin style components and set the SSR to true. You can also set the display name to true, which is pretty awesome uh, in development mode because instead of getting these uh, random ha like little hashes, which are always changing on you, uh, when you're debugging, you'll actually get the names of the uh, styles, the uh, style components that you've named. Um, so that's a great tool when you're inspecting by Chrome or Firefox. Uh, the future. So it's pretty awesome how it is right now, but uh, one of the great things with React 16 is that we have uh, streaming rendering. Um, however, with React Apollo, we're still not there exactly. Um, as I said, there's two unique distinct phases, uh, which is the async and the synchronous phase. Um, but in the future, like it is going to come, and maybe it will be called something like render to stream with data. So instead of uh, having to wait in that tree for those promises to resolve. Um, it will actually render down and send down your components uh, streaming so before it's not waiting on the server um, for everything to resolve before it sends it back to the client. Um, and this will be coming most likely in React Apollo 3.0, uh, which there's a, you can already test out, and it's a little bit, it's not necessarily rendered to stream data, but it utilizes React's upcoming async rendering model and the suspense. Uh, there's an awesome blog post by Peggy, which I'd all recommend everyone to go have a look at, and you can check it out on NPM as well, and just uh, tinker around and play with it. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Charles. All right, so welcome. I'm going to talk about Prisma. My name is Paul Dowman, and I'm the founder of OK Grow. As Charles mentioned, we do JavaScript and GraphQL. We do training, so we have a GraphQL training class that we've done quite a lot, including at the GraphQL Summit um, both years. And we do it in Toronto from time to time. Um, and we do JavaScript consulting. So what is Prisma? Well, first, I'm going to give a little bit of a roundabout, a uh, bit of background and stuff before we get there, just to make sure we've all got a common um, playing field in our understanding of, of like what all the pieces in GraphQL are. And I'm going to take us way back. So um, the very, like, a long time ago, before, uh, before server-side rendering was a thing that, that wasn't, that, that even had to, it didn't even have to have a name because that was the only thing you did, we had HTML apps. Uh, the server just rendered your app and sent it over the wire. Maybe it was using SOAP in the back end or something like that to communicate to some other services. But that's basically it. And the architecture there was monolithic. And typically, you had your own server that you installed it on. Then we started moving to REST, uh, and REST APIs became more popular. And not necessarily because of this, but around the same time, we started to have more microservice. We, we started to have more API-driven uh, frameworks, like we had mobile clients, uh, and we had started to get rich web frameworks. And, and then because we had more APIs, we started to build microservices. Um, and here we are in 2018, and GraphQL is becoming the most common way to have an API. And our architecture is kind of more moving, uh, at, the, at least at the leading edge of things, is moving more to like a serverless architecture where we don't care so much about uh, even virtual servers. We don't even care about servers. We just like run some code in the cloud, and we don't care how many uh, virtual um, containers it's in, whatever. Um, so. This is nice on the server side, on the you know hosting side, because of uh, uh, we don't have to actually care about we don't have to manage these servers. We don't care what OS version they're using. We don't care how many servers even there are these days. Um, the microservice thing is obviously great because it's it's layered. It, you can you can develop different pieces of it in different languages even if you want to, with different teams. And because of that, you can have faster development. And it is supposed to be if you're doing it right more decoupled. So why am I talking about all this? Well, because um, what the, the, the concept of, of like having microservice architectures is going to be something that's very important in, in how we got to have Prisma. So 
GraphQL API, I think most people in this room know why we want it, but um, you know, we've got type safety, and we've got more expressiveness, we've got this great tooling and ecosystem. Um, but a, a big question for a lot of people is how to do microservices with it. Um, so the answer, the answer to that is we're going to we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about uh, schema stitching in a few minutes. Um, but first, let's go to what a GraphQL architecture typically looks like. You got your client, you've got your GraphQL server. This is your app server, and you've got a database, right? So um, the client is going to make a GraphQL request to the server. The server ha is going to return some GraphQL based on something that came out of the database. Okay, that much is obvious. We're going to focus on, on the back end. So there's, there's going to be no more client side stuff tonight. Um, and the, the back end of this, so like I've said, is typically your application server, which we've got here listed as a uh, GraphQL server, and we've got your database. So what does this GraphQL server part of it look like? Well, we've got a schema, and we've got resolvers. The schema is your um, uh, is your type definitions, and the resolvers are the, the code that's in whatever language you're using that actually does the work of retrieving the data from the database. Then you got all your other junk, uh, network, middleware, that kind of stuff. So this is what it might look like. Um, I'm doing a brief recap here of of what uh, of, of what GraphQL on the server uh, looks like. So this is your schema. This is your your type definitions, and this is defining um, every every type every schema starts with a root object uh, a root uh, called query, and inside there, in this case, we're defining one we're defining one query called hello. It takes a parameter called name, which is of type string, and it returns a string, which is not allowed to be null in the result the return value. Now we have the resolvers. This is the JavaScript code that implements, uh, the, does the work of going to the database and, and fulfilling this query. Um, this happens to be JavaScript-based example, but it's kind of the same thing in whatever language or platform you're using. Let's say this, in this case, is a node server. So here's, here's a JavaScript function that, that takes a couple parameters, um, and the second one is, is uh, is we're pulling out something called name from a, from a complex object, and name is one of the parameters that got passed into the query. And we just do the work and, re and return, the value, return the value. In this case, it's just a string. Uh, and here's, your, here's all the other stuff that I referred to as just the extra junk a few minutes ago. This is, this is using something called GraphQL Yoga, which if you're running a node, if you're, if you're uh, using JavaScript, GraphQL Yoga, you should check it out. Uh, it's not the purpose of this talk, but just uh, incidentally, this is a really nice, quick way to set up uh, a GraphQL server, node-based GraphQL server with uh, a lot of good stuff built in. All right, here's a slightly more complex example, and this will be the one that we'll, we'll talk about with Prisma. So on the left, you have your, your schema. So this, is, this, this schema has a, a query called posts. And it returns an array of post objects. Now we've got the post type defined. Post type has a title, uh, some text, and an author. The author is a user. So now we've got uh, another, another level of nested uh, types. And the user, as you can see, has a name. And, uh, and also followers, which are more users. So we've got potentially infinite tree that we could, that we could nest here. This is where GraphQL really shines in, in stuff like this. We're joining multiple things together, nesting them arbitrarily. And then we have, on the right here, we have the resolvers, which will do the work. Um, you can see the post query. We, didn't, we don't show the implementation of the function, but it does something. goes to the database. Um, in the case of post, we don't... Uh, so title and text, you can see they're, they're just in there as comments. But in this case, we don't need to actually implement um, resolve other resolvers for them because those are scalars and they're, built, they're, they're part of the uh, object. But in the case of author, we have another resolver that does some more work, and it returns a user. And if, you, if you're not working with GraphQL yet, which I know not everybody in this room is, this is the beauty of it, where you can, you can um, rather than writing a single function that does all of the work to return the results, that you, that, that's what you would have done in REST. You would have done, written one function that does all the work of returning your whole 
uh, potentially graph or object tree of data. Um, rather than that, you have, you have lots of different functions that return each part of the tree. And they can be composed together and they can be um, called in, in, in different ways depending on what query the client specified. Okay, so that uh, hopefully is, is familiar because this is like a little too quick to be an, uh, like a, a real intro for, for GraphQL, but at least maybe if it's not a refresher, then um, it will help you know what you're looking for when you start looking, uh, when you start learning about GraphQL. So um, here's an example query that will query against this schema with these resolvers. And so as you can see, posts have an author, and the author is of type user, and that's, that's your first nested object, and that's the first place where we call a second resolver. Author has more users nested inside it, which is the followers. Um, and I, I won't go into this anymore, but um, it's called, you can, you can sort of map that over to the resolvers on the, uh, on, on the right-hand side here. Actually, let's quickly go, go through it. Uh, just uh, if, if you've got um, your author here, then it's going to end up calling the other resolver, which is this type user. Um, okay, said all that, so let's get through this. All right, so there are a bunch of patterns in, in GraphQL that uh, that I'm just going to like briefly mention, and then we're going to focus in on, on one of them, which is the database access. Authentication is done in lots of different ways. Um, a lot of times, it's not even done with GraphQL. If, if you're if you're migrating to GraphQL, you may be doing uh, authentication. In fact, most people are doing authentication outside of GraphQL because you have something that already works. Um, here's an example of doing the sign up and login in GraphQL, but this is not necessarily the way most people do it. There's no reason not to, but it's not, uh, it's not necessarily needed. So that's authentication. Authorization or permissions is done uh, in, in different ways. It can be done, ad sometimes it's done ad hoc in your, um, in, in your resolvers. Sometimes it can be done with directives, so that's an interesting thing to look for. Um, this example comes from GraphCool, which are the people that, that uh, that do that created Prisma, which we'll, we're, we're uh, gradually getting to, and they have this um, they have this concept of, of a uh, this permissions object, which kind of abstracts out the permissions, so that you don't have to have the permission logic writing the resolvers. Now, schema stitching is a relatively new thing, and this is really cool. And now we're getting to the 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 base of what allows uh, Prisma to actually happen. And if you're interested in doing microservices with GraphQL, this is, this is really interesting. So in this example, um, we take the, GraphQ, the, uh, sorry, the GitHub GraphQL API and basically merge it together with our own API. Now, you might not necessarily want to do this with someone else's public API because, uh, I don't know, I don't think I would throw GitHub's stuff like their actual schema definition into, into my own, but you might do this uh, just because it might change. Maybe, I mean, maybe, you would, maybe it would be appropriate to do that if it really is part of your public API to be uh, exposing some of the same objects as GitHub, but this is just an example. I think a, a more likely thing to use this for is you have multiple internal APIs that you control that are microservices, and you're gonna be, um, maybe, maybe you have different teams or maybe you just have your code separated in such a way that there are different packages, uh, or, or even different applications written in different languages. But this, the, um, but schema schema stitching allows you to put them together, served by one server, so that the client can make one request to one single uh, one single backend service, and and uh, be able to query multiple GraphQL based microservices. That's pretty cool. Um, now, in your resolvers, you're going to have to fetch your data from somewhere. Uh, th and this is where it starts to get kind of hairy, depending on where you access data. This is an example of, of a SQL query. 
And as you can see, it's a pretty long one, but this is pretty common, especially when you start trying to not uh, start to take care of it, not overfetching, requesting the right fields, things like that. It can it can start to look like this. There, there's a join in here. Um, as you can see, it gets pretty messy. Now, um, th this is something that people often solve with an ORM, uh, so that you don't have to put a string that represents uh, a query in your database language, whether it be Mongo or SQL or, or whatever it is. Rep putting those strings in your right in your um, in your resolvers or even in your in, if it's a REST API, in your in, right in your code. Uh, just mixing strings of anything like that into a JavaScript code, it's messy, it's hard to maintain, it opens you up to um, like SQL injection attacks, things like that, potentially, depending on how it's done. And this, so this is something that um, we're going to look at a potential solution to. Um, speaking of, of accessing data in, in resolvers, there's, there's some uh, like things that often happen, like you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to get this right. Um, a, a definite anti-pattern would be resolving all of the data in your root resolver. Um, you you want to make sure that you can have your sub your other resolvers that can be composable to get each part of the tree. Um, Overfetching with select star or even with manual field selection might be something that happens. And so um, we mentioned ORMs already. So. You can think of Prisma as sort of like an ORM, sort of like a GraphQL ORM. Um, so what we have here is some code that, uh, this is a resolver. The resolver is called public posts. Um, and this public posts resolver, th this takes the typical, uh, the typical four parameters of the resolver take, but let's, let's not focus, uh, focus on that. The third one is, um, CTX, which is often called context, and from the context, we have this. We get this object called DB, and on DB, we can see that it exposes some methods, uh, some other objects and methods. So we can we can call uh, DB dot query dot posts, and then we start building up this. We're building up a JavaScript object here that represents a query. So what's going on? This is called GraphQL binding. Now this is we're not we're not uh, talking about Prisma yet, but we're this is another one of the building blocks that that gets us there. GraphQL bindings, whether or not you're using Prisma, is a, is an interesting thing because um, this lets you uh, use your lang your your uh, programming languages built-in constructs like objects to to actually make to, to map to a, a query um, against the GraphQL server. So. You've got, uh, in this case, a JavaScript object that represents your GraphQL query against another server somewhere, another GraphQL API somewhere else. So yes, GraphQL was originally created to, for clients to make queries to servers, but it's not, it, it, its usefulness doesn't end there. GraphQL is great for servers to query each other. Um, and in this case, we have one server making a query to another server. Now. The server that it's querying, in this case, happens to be Prisma, which is, um, uh, which is the, well, well, we'll get to that. It's the GraphQL API for a database in this case. So back to our architecture that we showed earlier. Here's our, our GraphQL server in a database. Prisma adds in another layer into the architecture. And as you can see, we just added another box in there. So we've got Instead of just the server talking to the database, now the server talks to this new box, which is Prisma. Prisma then talks to the database. So you could think of uh, Prisma as a, as a GraphQL API for your, for your database. Uh, you could think of it as a GraphQL database proxy. So if you have a SQL database, Prisma sits in front of it, and you don't have SQL in your app, you have you can you make GraphQL queries from your server, and you make GraphQL queries to Prisma, and and Prisma um, Prisma translate that into accessing your database for you. So it generates a, a CRUD GraphQL API for your database. So if it knows that you've got um, uh, something called posts, there's going to be a table that's going to correspond to a table called posts in your database, which Prisma manages for you. 
um, it's going to generate uh, mutations and queries so that you can access and, and manipulate all the data in post so you can query it, all kinds of things. We'll see a little bit of that in a minute. And it helps with your database workflows like migrations. So if you've ever managed a production app, you've probably had to deal with changing the schema, uh, maybe unless you're using Mongo, but you're going to be, you're going to be writing, often writing migrations to change, uh, like adding columns to your tables and things. Prisma does this for you. So you could, if you wanted to, you could not even know that there is a SQL database. You could just, you could just uh, imagine that you're querying this Prisma service. We're going to talk about uh, why and how this is useful and some potential um, situations that, that you, you might want. Like, for example, uh, you, can, you can actually migrate away from this if you want in the future. So this is like something that, that like, I personally was concerned about when I first looked into this. The question is, well, okay, if you're adding this other thing in, how, how much are you locked in? Well, it's actually a SQL database behind there, and you can, you can incrementally migrate away, away from Prisma if you ever wanted to. So um, you have a data model that, that could look, for example, like this, where we've got a user and, and a post object, and it's defined using the GraphQL um, schema description. So Gra GraphQL, you, you, decide, you describe what you want using GraphQL uh, type defs. Um, it's very easy to express relations, of course, because that's what GraphQL is good at. You can compose your things together. In this case, we've got uh, the user has multiple posts. Um, and then you've got all these uh, primitives in GraphQL, like, uh, like enums and interfaces, unions, things like that. It's a nice language to describe your data, um, and but it, but what it is not is a query API. Uh, it does not define a query language. Or, okay, it is a query language, but it, it does not define um, things that that like SQL. It's not SQL, right? It's not. It doesn't define a lot of the things that SQL or MongoDB define. But Prisma adds these things, so it automatically gave us. In, in the, for the example that I just showed earlier where we've got users and posts, it, Prisma would generate uh, this, you would be able to make a query like this. And this is all stuff that, that Prisma generated. So let's take a look a little deeper at that. Um, it works with GraphQL bindings as, as we showed earlier. So in your resolver, here we are making, um, making a query to posts by just calling uh, db.query.post, and then we build up this where query with author, where the name starts with Edgar. Everything is pretty readable, actually. Um, all that stuff, like first and order by, Prisma, Prisma generates that and gives you that. Um, if you've got a static, statically typed language, like TypeScript or something, then it's even nicer. OK, uh, I'm going to do a little quick demo of this. Um, how readable is that? Bigger? Okay. All right, so um, first you just install Prisma with, with NPM install. You globally install it with Yarn or NPM. And then you've got a command called Prisma. We're just going to do Prisma init hello world 2 in this case because I ran this just before the talk and I've already got one called hello world. OK, it's going to give us some options. Uh, we're going to say full stack with boilerplate. This is going to give us uh, like actually a boilerplate app with some basic with some uh, demo functionality. Uh, no basic, basic GraphQL server, including database. Install some stuff. And Done. Okay, maybe the network connection is not the best here. Probably will be faster when you do it. And uh, there we go. Now, if you notice, it says running Prisma deploy. So what's that all about? Well, you can. So I mentioned that that Prisma is like a proxy for a database. So there's got to be a MySQL, in this case it's MySQL database running somewhere. 
Um, you can have it running on your own machine with, on a local cluster with Docker. We're going to go for the simple solution for that, which is just really quick and easy, which is deploy it to their managed uh, service called Prisma Cloud. Okay, in the uh, US region, hit enter, it's deploying. Bunch of magic happens, and there we go. All right, so now we can just type yarn dev, and it's going to start a local node server. Um, oops, I have to cd into the directory first. All right. There we go. Okay, it started up, and it, it opened up um, a web browser, hitting the local, if you can't see it, this is uh, localhost 3000. And this is, this is what you see here, it's called uh, GraphQL Playground. It's kind of like graphical. This is also made by the people at GraphQL, who are, who, like I mentioned, make Prisma. They've built a ton of amazing GraphQL cool, uh, tooling, like uh, a ton of stuff that I'm not going to go into, but they've, they've contributed a, a lot of really good stuff. So this thing is a lot like, think of it like um, graphical on steroids, if you're familiar with graphical. Okay, and right now we're querying localhost 4000, which is our app server. Um, so I've got a, a, a uh, oh yeah, we, we can show our schema at the side. We've got something called uh, feed. So let's start with querying feed. Got it. I've got a query here. This is asking for the feed with the ID and title. There we go. So there was some seed data that was in there. Now, um, let's take a look at, that's, that's querying our app. Now we can query the database itself. So if I go over to, this is actually uh, something that graphical cannot do that GraphQL Playground can, is to query multiple places. Now, if you look at this, uh, it's now it's querying to a GraphQL endpoint at um, us.prisma.sh slash a bunch of other stuff. That is the that is the Prisma that's the hosted because we're using Prisma Cloud. This is our GraphQL API for the database. So we've got a, a local node service that's making GraphQL API calls out to this to this thing, which is running somewhere in the cloud, which is containing Prisma and uh, MySQL API. If I look at the schema here, it's actually different. So if you remember on, on our app, our app exposed something called feed. This is just more the raw data. We've got posts, and we've got post, and then we've got post connection, and node, and this other stuff. Create, update, delete, just the raw cut stuff. All right, let's take a quick look at what the code looks like. Um, how readable is that? Okay. So let's start, okay, there's, this, there's a config file, and that's some stuff that we're going to ignore, but let's look in here, database. There's a directory called database, and there's something called data model.graphql. So here's our post. This was generated by the boilerplate team. This is our, this is our definition of what's, in the, of what's in the database. So having this here caused Prisma to create a, a table called posts in MySQL. Uh, and, and then it caused Prisma to add some fields to the database, uh, an ID and it's published, and, and it knows their types. So it's going to add them with the right, the right types in, inside MySQL. Um, Prisma then generates some, some more stuff for us. It actually, I'll show you what it, what it generates. It generates this, so uh, there's going to be a ton of stuff in here. All of that, all the other mutations that we can so that we can do all those queries that we saw with, um, uh, with this, like, you know, the uh, pagination and like skip and count and all that kind of stuff. So tons of mutations here, a lot, a lot of stuff, but you don't really have to look at that. It's just kind of hidden for you. But it's built. It's um, let's close that generating folder. It's imported into our schema. Now this is this is the app. This is another file which contains the schema that our app API exposes. So we're exposing a query called feed. 
And feed is of type post, but um, post is the thing that that is actually coming through from our other database, from our Prisma database. Um, now, I could add some other field in here if I wanted to, and then redeploy the Prisma service, and it will it will create a migration for us, and up and update the table structure in MySQL, um, and then from that point on, we we now have new things in our in our schema that comes from Prisma, and that schema is stitched into our schema that that our app is providing through it through this API, and then um, so we've got. That, that new field will be all the way through. Okay, uh, that was a pretty quick overview. And if we have questions, we can go into it a bit more. But I'm gonna get back to the slides. Um, I had some slides here in case the, uh, this is the same stuff in case my live demo blew up. So here, here we are again, just a review of what the infrastructure looks like. You've got the server, and you've got the Prisma. Uh, Prisma has a, a new piece in your architecture. Not necessarily something that you have to run and manage, though, because it's, it can be the hosting service. Okay, uh, and I mentioned Prisma Cloud a bit, so you know, again, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be Prisma Cloud. This can be totally your own infrastructure. Um, the migration path away is is also quite straightforward if it's your own infrastructure, whether it is or not. Um, you can, well, actually not if it's Prisma Cloud. Let's say it's your own infrastructure. You can query that SQL server directly if you if you need to migrate away from it. Uh, it will have a sane and reasonable schema, I trust. And um, if you're using Prisma Cloud, though, there are some other benefits. So not only is it hosted and managed for you, which is nice, but um, it, it does have this command line, scriptable management tools, but you get this a, a data browser UI as well, which is kind of cool. Um, so something like this. So you can you can just uh, ha have like a nice graphical view of what's in your tables. You can edit it simply. Um, you can run GraphQL, GraphQL Playground. You can so do ad hoc queries against it if you want to right in this UI. Um, so that, that's kind of nice for especially when you're at the prototyping stage of things. All right. So uh, I would argue GraphQL is, is really now the, the new default for building APIs, more and more so. Um, and Prisma makes it easier to implement your, your resolvers that are fetching data. And that's pretty much it. Thank you.